The date was October the 29th, 1998. The place, Christie's of New York, the world's oldest fine art auctioneers. Bidding was about to begin on a rather small and unassuming manuscript, a manuscript that had been in a small private collection for years. The volume was moldy and charred, ravaged by a thousand years of weather, travel and abuse. Pages were missing. Even so, experts said the book could sell for $800,000. The book was being sold not for its looks, but for what it contains. The oldest surviving copy of works by the ancient Greek mathematician Archimedes. $1,900,000 in the front row at $1,900,000. $2,000,000. When the gavel went down, the manuscript had, in fact, $2 sold for $2 million. $2 million it is, panel 169. To an anonymous collector. My client was extremely calm, and I think that posterity will prove him right. It was a tremendously good buy, um, perhaps the most important text manuscript ever to have been sold at auction. And I'm thrilled to have been part of um, the purchase of it. Take a pencil and a piece of paper Think creatively, and you are able to find something true about the physical, external world. This was the discovery made by Archimedes. Very few people made discoveries of equivalent importance. Think Galileo, think Newton, think Einstein. The manuscript sold at Christie's that day is the only source of Archimedes' method of mechanical theorems in which Archimedes pioneered the study of calculus. And the manuscript is the only source of Archimedes' famous treatise on floating bodies in the original Greek. In the treatise, Archimedes explores the physics of flotation and clarifies the principle of specific gravity. Archimedes thought in diagrams. Now we've got an access to his thinking because we've got an access to his diagrams. This book gives us a unique source for the diagrams which Archimedes himself drew in the sand. And now, the Walters Art Gallery, renowned worldwide both for its superlative collection of manuscripts and for its skill in manuscript conservation, has been entrusted with this unique book. It is a great privilege to have the Archimedes Palimpsest because in a way, we have a window onto a time very removed from where we are now and we have that window and we're obliged to bring to this side of the window to look through it those people most capable first of preserving the book and secondarily of understanding the book and what the book tells us about the learning of Archimedes and the science of the past. Give me a place to stand and I will move the earth. Archimedes of Syracuse spoke these words in the third century BC. Archimedes may not have moved the earth yet his work has a profound influence on us even today. The Archimedes screw still irrigates fields in developing countries. Archimedes also revealed the mathematical principles behind the fulcrum and the lever. Throughout the world, we still use a clever device for which Archimedes elucidated the mathematical principle, the pulley. And Archimedes' games and puzzles are still played throughout the world. Archimedes, the mathematical genius, found his talents well used in his birthplace, Syracuse, on the Mediterranean island of Sicily, dominated by the great volcano, Mount Etna. In the third century BC, Syracuse was, as it is today, a hub of commerce, art, and science. In Syracuse, Archimedes first endeared himself to King Hiero II by solving a puzzle dear to the king's heart. Had Hiero's goldsmith tried to cheat the king by adding cheaper metals to the king's new crown. Archimedes' task? To analyze the crown without harming the crown itself. An answer to the puzzle came to Archimedes in his bath. History recalls Archimedes leaping from his tub at the moment of inspiration, shouting, Eureka, I found it, and running naked through the streets of Syracuse. Later, King Hiero brought Archimedes' genius to bear on more urgent matters, such as war. At that time, Syracuse was a Greek colony. On this massive altar, built by King Hiero, Archimedes participated in sacrifices to Greek gods. Archimedes watched Greek tragedies in this magnificent amphitheater, which still bears inscriptions on seats reserved for dignitaries, including King Hiero's, carved when Archimedes lived 2,200 years ago. 
Although the various kings of Syracuse allied themselves with great powers, such as Carthage and Rome, they were often forced to defend the walls of their city. In 214 BC, under the command of their general Marcellus, legions of the Roman army sailed to Syracuse and besieged the city, which had recently formed an alliance with Carthage. In response, Archimedes fortified the magnificent stronghold of Syracuse, the Euryalos Fortress, which sits high above the city on the Epipoli Plain. Putting his theories of pulleys and levers to work, Archimedes designed war machines to keep the Romans at bay. From the walls of the island, Archimedes guarded the city against sea attacks by projecting huge beams of wood to gouge the hulls of enemy ships. Archimedes' genius defended the city of Syracuse for more than two years. Eventually, however, the Romans penetrated the great mathematician's ingenious defenses and stormed the city. Soon after, a Roman soldier came to Archimedes and demanded that the great military genius accompany him to the quarters of General Marcellus. Archimedes refused, claiming he had yet to finish a mathematical problem that presently occupied his attention. The soldier, in anger, struck the 75-year-old Archimedes dead. Despite his cleverness with mechanical gadgets and his many engineering legacies, Archimedes himself was far more interested in abstract mathematical theorems and in recording his theories for posterity. Archimedes wrote out his theories on papyrus scrolls. Succeeding generations preserved his works by copying and recopying them onto other scrolls. In the fourth century AD, scribes began to copy onto sheets of parchment, which were later bound between wooden boards. They had invented the book. The Archimedes manuscript now in the care of the Walters Art Gallery is the end product of just this sort of process. The manuscript dates to the later years of the 10th century AD. Although manufactured more than a thousand years after the great mathematician's death, this book is the earliest copy of Archimedes' treatise to survive. It is fitting that the manuscript was made in the Mediterranean city of Constantinople, present-day Istanbul, because this city was already indebted to Archimedes. Here, Constantinople's greatest monument, the 6th century church, Hagia Sophia, was designed by Isidore of Miletus, who had been inspired by a work by Archimedes called On the Sphere and the Cylinder. From about 300 AD until about 1200, Constantinople was the one place in the Mediterranean where you could count on finding Greek texts and a tradition of people who were studying them carefully. In 1204, Constantinople suffered a major disaster. The Fourth Crusade had got there, and instead of proceeding direct to the Holy Land, they stopped and they sacked the city. The destruction of books and other historic monuments was immense a major disaster for the history of European culture. It's a stroke of luck that Archimedes survived. Probably we have only 1% of the literature written in the ancient world. The scribe who copied Archimedes' work used sheets of parchment. To make parchment, skins of young goats and sheep are soaked for several weeks in a solution of old lime, then draped over a wooden beam and scraped with a dull knife. Then the clean skins are tensioned like a drum on a wooden frame and left to dry, and scraped once more with a razor-sharp blade. The skin of one goat provides two large sheets, about 15 by 12 inches in size. So, even in its current incomplete state, the Archimedes manuscript consists of 87 sheets, in other words, the skins of 43 and a half goats. Once trimmed, the parchment was prepared for writing by ruling the lines with a blunt point. To write the text of Archimedes' work, the scribe used a reed pen and ink made from crushed oak galls, that is, small, abnormal tree growths formed by insects, rich in tannic acid. Once his copying was complete, the scribe nested four folded sheets together to form a kind of booklet known as a choir and then assembled all of his choirs in their proper order, sewing them together with a robust linen thread. After he'd attached wooden boards and end bands, the book would have looked much like this one. Finally, the scribes covered the boards with a piece of tanned and dyed goatskin, 
and attached woven leather straps to keep it closed. The completed Archimedes manuscript in the 10th century was a large book, over a foot in height. However, the Archimedes manuscript as it survives today appears this way, a mere eight inches in height. Inside, instead of Archimedes' theorems and formulae, is a medieval Christian prayer book. Where are the writings of Archimedes? If you look closely, you can still see them beneath the religious text. What happened? The answer to this mystery has involved elaborate research, modern literary detective work, if you will. By piecing together clues from throughout the centuries, we formed a biography of the book, where it's been, how it survived, and how it's been returned to the public eye. Apparently, in the 12th century, 200 years after the Archimedes text was written, another scribe, we believe in Constantinople, took the manuscript apart. With a sharp knife, he scraped off as much of the Archimedes text as he could. He cut the leaves in half along the inner fold so that he could make a book half the size. Then, he turned the pages by 90 degrees and folded them in half. This second scribe ruled fresh lines and copied his religious texts onto the parchment. The result we call a palimpsest, a text on parchment that has been overwritten with other text. Palimpsests were made a lot in the Middle Ages because writing material was in short supply. It was expensive, especially parchment, but even paper, though cheaper, wasn't always readily available. And Archimedes would be a good candidate to become palimpsest because it wasn't one of the popular texts. You had to be an advanced mathematician to understand it. So to have a copy still surviving is a great piece of good fortune. To the second scribe who copied the religious text over the original work, the underlying mathematical theories of Archimedes were, quite literally, not worth the parchment they were written on. The second scribe was, in effect, recycling valuable parchment. Far more important to him was the Christian need for a prayer book, or eucologion, that contained texts for repentance, prayers for the sick, even a naming ceremony for a child. And so the work of Archimedes lay hidden for centuries in this Christian disguise. How did this small book survive through the centuries? We know that once the manuscript had become a religious text, it was cared for as a sacred document in the Holy Land at the monastery of Mar Saba between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. The monastery is a lofty and colossal structure rising in stories and terraces to the top of a magnificent but barren gorge in the heart of the Judean desert the wilderness where Christ himself wandered for 40 days. The monastery still flourishes, soon to celebrate 1,500 years of continuous prayer. This hasn't always been easy. The monastery's chapel houses the bones of monks martyred for their beliefs. Despite this, the monks themselves have a great reputation for hospitality and the care of the sick. And so our prayer book, which contains exorcisms for unclean spirits, and prayers for the sick would undoubtedly have played an important role in the community's daily life. We believe the monastery provided safe haven for the book for over 400 years in the library at the top of Justinian's tower, the apex of this extraordinary complex of buildings. Early in the 19th century, the manuscript was moved to the library of the Greek Patriarch in the Christian quarter of Old Jerusalem, some 10 miles away. The library is next door to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where the Patriarch has his throne. Traditionally the center of the earth, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the most holy place in Christendom, housing the site of Christ's crucifixion, the Rock of Golgotha, and of his resurrection the Holy Sepulchre itself. We believe that the book then travelled from this church to a related religious community, the Metochion of the Holy Sepulchre in Constantinople, where the book had been made 900 years earlier. We know the Archimedes manuscript was in Constantinople in 1846, 
because the biblical scholar Constantine Tischendorf visited the Metochion in that year to study the library's substantial collection of manuscripts. Tischendorf claimed to find nothing of particular interest apart from a palimpsest dealing with mathematics. Tischendorf took a leaf from this manuscript. It is now housed in Cambridge University Library in England. A colleague suggested that I should go to Cambridge to look at a single leaf of a palimpsest with an unidentified mathematical text. I went to Cambridge in due course and started looking at it. Very soon I was able to say, this is Archimedes, and I realized that this leaf actually fits into the Archimedes palimpsest between folios two and three. Tischendorf himself didn't fully grasp the importance of the palimpsest. It wasn't until 1906, armed with but a magnifying glass, that the Danish philologist Johann Ludwig Heiberg meticulously transcribed the manuscript, perhaps only vaguely suspecting its origins at first. His achievement, without the benefit of modern technology, was little short of miraculous. The next year, Heiberg began to publish his work. Heiberg's announcement that he discovered a previously unknown treatise by Archimedes made headlines in the New York Times on July the 16th, 1907. Today, the extraordinary journey of the Archimedes palimpsest is far from over. After the exhibition, the Walters will begin the long process of stabilizing the fragile leaves of the manuscript. The manuscript is actually in very poor condition. The worst damage has been caused by the mold. What's happened is that the microorganisms have actually eaten the parchment support and left the skin very weak. And with handling, um, with the flexing of the leaves, those very weak areas um, have now perforated through. We can preserve what's left and hope to stabilize it for the future. As the book exists today, it's very difficult to read. However, modern science will permit us to interpret a great deal of Archimedes' writings. Through digital enhancement and ultraviolet light, we've already been able to see the writings of Archimedes clearly for the first time. With the help of technologies such as multispectral imaging, we'll one day be able to read virtually all of the Archimedes text that was painstakingly written a thousand years ago. Preserving the Archimedes manuscript could take years the conservation of the Archimedes palimpsest is like working on a big puzzle. Right now, the leaves are in the sequence of the 12th century text. After the manuscript is taken apart and the leaves are rearranged according to their Archimedes sequence, we will digitize them using a digital camera and very sophisticated techniques to capture the 10th century Archimedes text. After a thousand years of travel, this book is now in critical condition. As a scholar of our communities, I'm extremely happy that now it receives the best possible attention and care in the laboratories of the Walters Art Gallery. Many centuries ago, and across several seas, Archimedes, the great mathematician, once solved the puzzle of a lifetime. How to analyze the king's crown while preserving the crown itself. Similarly, analyzing the nearly indecipherable text of Archimedes in this remarkable manuscript while preserving the fragile leaves upon which the text is written, poses a challenge even to the country's top conservators here at the Walters Art Gallery. Ours is a puzzle that Archimedes himself would certainly appreciate. <laughs>